Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, you can all hear me. Um, my name is Derek Collins. I'm an Associate Dean of the Humanities here at the University of Michigan. And just to give you a sense of the layout of what that means here, um, the Humanities Division comprises all of the language departments, uh, national language departments, but also a few that have combined uh, regions. So for example, departments of Near Eastern Studies, all the literature departments, uh, English, comparative literature, and because of some odd recusal rules this year, uh, it even includes uh, history as one of the departments um, over which I have supervision. Um, this is interesting, and I may mention this a little bit later, but a, a, large, a larger, increasingly larger number of the cases for promotion in history departments uh, are now using literary sources so heavily that there's a feeling that they are more uh, suitably reviewed um, by humanities divisional committees than by uh, previously uh, social science committees. So there's lots of, lots of changes within the discipline of history itself that I think are worth considering in the context of the larger conference here today. Before I, um, I start, though, I absolutely want to, uh, to say thanks to uh, Dean Monica Ponce de Leon. Since she's been here at the University of Michigan, she's been nothing but uh, spectacular. Uh, and I also want to say thanks to uh, her staff, uh, namely Alicia. Uh, when you become an administrator, you lose uh, immediate control over your calendar. Uh, and if it weren't for the likes of Alicia, um, I don't know that I would have made it here today. Um, as you'll notice, I have no PowerPoint. One of the worst things that's ever happened to university administrations is the introduction of PowerPoint. Um, we die by PowerPoint now on a regular basis. And so I'm deliberately uh, going to keep this to, uh, to a talk. So what I'd like to do today in my talk is I'd like to approach some of these issues from the perspective of a dean, but also briefly from the perspective of myself as a classicist. I'm trained primarily in Greek and Latin and in um, antiquity. Uh, and so I really kind of want to try to combine the two, but the upshot of all of this will be some thoughts ultimately about pedagogy and our uh, nasty undergraduates uh, who, um, uh, that, that we think about continually uh, at the university uh, in trying to make their lives uh, better. This reminds me, though, of a, of a joke I heard recently um, that I wanted to sh share with you about a Nobel laureate. Um, <clears throat> there was this prize-winning physicist who um, had discovered something or other and won the Nobel Prize for it. Uh, well, he was, became instantly famous and got invited to university after university uh, across the country to give lectures on his work. He even hired a chauffeur because he was traveling so much. Uh, and you know, he would give this uh, detailed, uh, incredibly technical kind of lecture uh, that frankly, even if you were a physicist, you might have difficulty understanding it. Um, but the guy was brilliant, no doubt uh, about it. Well, at one point, he gets invited to a prestigious university on the West Coast. Um, the name of the university is not so important. And while taking a kind of longish drive from the airport to campus, his chauffeur says, uh, Professor, I have to say, there's no question you're a genius with all the things you've discovered and all of your research, uh, but I've been listening to you give your Nobel lecture uh, over uh, on and off throughout the past year, and in fact, I've heard it so many times that I've practically memorized it, uh, word for word. Uh, I'll make you a bet, even, says the chauffeur, that I know your lecture so well uh, that I could even deliver it myself. I'd sound just like you, and no one would know the difference. So the professor thought about this for a moment, uh, and thinking, in fact, that uh, he was getting a little weary from all the traveling and lecturing, uh, and then musing about how fun this might be uh, for his colleagues, said, what the heck? Uh, so he says to his chauffeur, OK, it's a deal. I don't think you can do it, but you can have the shot. When we get to campus, let's switch clothes. I'll dress up like the chauffeur, and uh, like you, and you'll dress up like me, and then uh, we'll see if you can really do this. So the chauffeur says, no problem, uh, and they get to the university and they do that. Now, when they walk into the lecture hall at the appointed time for the lecture, it's packed, another huge audience. And the chauffeur, now dressed as the professor, uh, takes the stage, while the professor, now cleverly disguised, uh, sits <coughs> right here in the front row. So the lecture begins, and sure enough, with the same exact detail, word for word, even with the same pauses for emphasis, he delivers this complicated scientific presentation. It comes off without a hitch, in fact, it's so good. There's applause, and everyone seemed pleased, uh, nodding to one another in affirmation. And after all of that dies down, the moderator asks if the professor would be willing to take some questions. 
Well, a guy in the back of the room raises his hand and then asks the most academic of questions about the lecture. Clearly, he was a physicist too. I mean, this was like a paragraph long question with equations and numbers and the kind of thing that only a few specialists would understand, would be in a position to understand. On stage, the professor pauses and thinks a bit, looks like he's calculating something in his head, and then he says, that's the stupidest question I've ever heard. <laughs> ever. Just stupid. Do we even understand physics? In fact, it's such a stupid question, I'll show you how dumb it is. Your question is so dumb, that in fact, even my chauffeur sitting here in the front row can answer it. All right, there you go. Um, <laughs> now, when I was asked to participate in today's panel, I have to say, uh, not being a specialist at all in architectural history, not to mention architecture, uh, I was certainly a bit nervous about what I would say. Uh, as I said, I'm a classicist by training, and I've had the pleasure now of listening for at least uh, a day uh, or so uh, to all of your anxieties. And boy, you folks have some anxieties. Uh, <laughs> I mean, my God. It's <laughs> so um, so uh, being a classicist by training, you know, I, I, I'm not primarily trained as a historian. I have an interest in history, but I'm mainly trained in literature uh, and language and religious history for the most part. Um, and uh, as I say, for being um, uh, dean of the humanities, including history, uh, here at the University of Michigan for several years, though, I've had a chance to see up close some of the kinds of work coming across the transom, so to speak, in promotion cases, both tenure cases as well as full professor cases. And, and there's a lot of interesting things uh, going on. Um, but like I say, uh, you know, given the anxieties in my own field, I am greatly relieved to hear that you guys are <laughs> as stressed out as you are. Um, <laughs> I really had not, notwithstanding the title of the uh, conference, uh, the title of this conference, I really hadn't understood how much anxiety there was about architectural history as a discipline, where it might fit within history as opposed to architecture, especially with its uh, strongly uh, divided um, design group, uh, and with its own legacy to art history going all the way back to the uh, 19th century, in which architecture was treated like some redheaded stepchild or something. Um, like I say, my own discipline of classics has an equally checkered history. Um, in some sense, uh, stemming as it does from the life and times uh, of monks in medieval monasteries, uh, and then to an antiquarian connoisseurship uh, enjoyed as a pastime by aristocrats and landed gentry uh, well into the 19th century, uh, and then to a thriving, if small and tenacious, discipline of the 20th and the early 21st centuries, uh, with its occasional, um, what I call, utilitarian lapses, such as when in the 1980s in some states the training of high school Latin teachers was justified uh, on the grounds that it improved uh, SAT scores. Um, these arguments were actually used uh, in state legislatures in states like Texas to uh, continue funding for universities uh, and for high school Latin teachers precisely because it would ultimately improve the educational outcomes of students. Classics as a discipline, though, still hesitates in the wake of the culture wars um, in the, of the 80s uh, to regard itself as controlling uh, the Western literary canon, uh, particularly as other important literary disciplines like English have followed history uh, into the wake of global and transnational studies uh, and is now trying to recuperate itself as the home of what they're calling uh, world literature. Um, if disciplines like English in the always uh, mercurial field of comparative literature, and remember in the 90s, comparative, comparative literature was in the forefront of theory, um, as was mentioned by one of the speakers earlier, uh, when theory caused a crisis or precipitated a crisis in architectural history itself. Uh, but nevertheless, as disciplines like English and comparative literature uh, move toward a, a more global uh, approach, uh, they'll inevitably encroach on the territory of other humanities disciplines uh, that do not require mastery of a foreign language um, as a sort of uh, measure of uh, entry into the discipline or as a measure of uh, attaining competence within the discipline. Um, there are a couple of exceptions here, philosophy and linguistics. Um, both of these fields traditionally regarded as humanities, although ling linguistics very much tends to waver now between social sciences. These fields have both become so technical in their own respective ways uh, that they are um, often not regarded as really being as formally aligned with the humanities as, as some other uh, of the fields that I've been uh, mentioning. Um, if you think of the humanities uh, traditionally understood as a kind of being concerned with the, the modes and valences of human expressive activity, 
uh, you can really see uh, the problems in uh, philosophy, in analytical philosophy, for example, and then the computational side of linguistics, which at this point might as well be um, computer science. Now, being a classicist is somewhat like being a necromancer in that you have to coax life out of dead things. Uh, you really do. Uh, and so I have no anxiety about returning to uh, antiquity, to ancient texts, to ancient origins, such as they are. And so at the risk of offending your architectural sensibilities, uh, I want to return for a moment to the great uh, Vitruvius, uh, sometimes called the most famous plumber in ancient Rome. Um, someone showed a slide yesterday of the first issue, I guess it was your Journal of Architecture or of Architectural History, uh, with his famous terms, uh, firmitas, uh, solidity, uh, utilitas, usefulness, and uh, venustas, uh, a term that um, directly uh, reminds you of Venus and therefore has to do with uh, beauty. Uh, and uh, th these three qualities being required of any structure. Well, I can't think of a more comprehensive definition of an architect, in fact, in Roman antiquity, uh, than the one proposed by Vitruvius uh, in his uh, books on architecture, De Architectura, in the first century BCE. Um, this work, you might remember, is dedicated to Augustus, sometimes after the Battle of Actium in 31 BC, after Octavian then changes his name to Augustus, and he becomes uh, the first emperor and architect, uh, quote unquote, politically and culturally speaking, of, um, of Rome. Uh, in the opening book, the first book of, uh, on architecture, Vitruvius begins with a discussion of the training of an architect. And this is why I thought this might be relevant today for, um, for our panel. And there appear to be two main skills at issue that Vitruvius is concerned with. I mean, he writes that, um, and I'll just quote, that architects who without culture, literae, um, literally from the uh, Latin litera, plural literae, meaning letters, comes to mean documents, education, philosophy, and so forth. Um, so architects who without culture aim at manual skill cannot gain a prestige corresponding to their labors. While those who trust in theory and culture, literae again, alone, obviously follow a shadow and not reality. But those who have acquired both, like men equipped with full armor, soon acquire influence and attain their purpose. So these two skills, a practical and an intellectual one, uh, were in antiquity much more broadly interpreted than we might understand them today. On the practical side, of course, uh, ancient architects were much more likely to be um, sort of an equivalent to engineers. Uh, they were experts in ballistics. They were designers of military weaponry. Vitruvius himself served as an artillery, uh, what's called a, a ballet stuff, for example, an artillery man while serving in Caesar's uh, army. Um, and then they had subspecialties in things like aqueducts and plumbing, um, absolutely crucial for uh, the baths, for example, in Rome. Uh, they had expertise in harmonics and acoustics. Uh, hence, uh, they had an expertise in the design of theaters uh, and temples to honor the gods, um, a, a crucial aspect of, of all um, uh, urban architecture and, 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 and suburban to some extent uh, in antiquity. Uh, and then, in general, some of them could even rise to the level of a Vitruvius, which, which, which arguably um, looked a little bit more like what we would call maybe an urban or a city uh, planner. But the basis for this wide-ranging expertise uh, on the evidence of Vitruvius seems to flow from that other intellectual side of the architect. And here's where we find a range of knowledge, both humanistic and scientific, regarded as absolutely essential to the formation of the consummate architect. The architect should be a man of letters, of culture, a skillful draftsman, Vitruvius writes, a mathematician, familiar with history, historia, which um, is a little bit more narrow than our current meaning, uh, a diligent student of philosophy, philosophia, acquainted with music, not ignorant of medicine, learned in the responses of uh, juris consults, or uh, lawyers, interpreters of the law, and familiar with astronomy and of astronomical calculations. Now, why these skills specifically? Well, by being a man of letters, Vitruvius's model architect will be able to keep a record of accomplishments for posterity. That's what he writes. Uh, one cannot help but see a reference here to the massive work of Vitruvius himself. Um, and of course, within this work, he cites dozens and dozens of other, uh, mainly Greek, but to some extent also uh, Roman um, architects slash engineers, uh, their accounts of the various buildings or temples or, or ornaments that they themselves um, uh, had, had built. By his skill in draftsmanship, says Vitruvius, the architect will find it easier to render the structure uh, or the effect desired. 
Uh, and in particular, he's concerned about um, space and spatial dimensions. Um, and, as, and if you're really interested in this, this actually takes shape in the Roman theater itself um, as the backdrop of the theater and the spatial dimensions there uh, are, are, are talked about by Vitruvius as, as, a, as an example of how uh, perspective makes its way into cultural life um, more generally. Um, mathematics teaches the use of the rule and the compass, says Vitruvius, facilitates the laying out of buildings and the effects of lighting, the properties of optics, and the problems of measurement and symmetry can be worked out. By arithmetic, of course, he adds, uh, the cost of a building is summed up. Architects ought to be familiar with history, uh, because in their profession they will design many buildings, ornaments, and temples that have reference to a particular historical event. So think about the way he's, he's talking about this. It's not a broad knowledge of history so much as how a particular building came into being. It's from this perspective that history is important because the architect will want to render an account, Vitruvius writes, to inquirers of why a given building is constructed the way it is and what it represents. And here he proceeds to give accounts of certain military victories and the monuments and trophies erected in their memory. As one example, we hear of the Spartan military victory under the command of Pausanias during the Persian Wars over a huge contingent of uh, Persians, after which a marble colonnade was erected in the marketplace. The Greeks used statues of Persian uh, warriors uh, dressed in their, in their barbarian uh, gear to serve as columns to hold up the roof, and they did this because it would forever signify Persian subordination to Greek uh, bravery. Um, so hated were the Persians uh, by the Greeks, in fact, that Vitruvius says that this became a style and a feature of many Greek monuments with uh, Persians upholding uh, various architraves and ornaments. Now philosophy too is important, says Vitruvius, because it makes the architect high-minded, not arrogant but urbane, fair and loyal, and most importantly, he says, it enables him to work without avarice, to guard his dignity and keep a good name, a reputation for fair and honest dealing. However, philosophy serves another purpose, and it's in this sense that he actually is thinking more about the Greek notion of philosophy, which is that it is really the nature of things, of all things, including the physical world, natural law, and so on. And he goes through a number of examples of why this is uh, important. Talks again about acoustics and harmonics and how theaters are designed with particular uh, um, uh, emphasis uh, so that the seats, for example, divide up the uh, intervals of the octave the Greeks themselves then placed uh, um, hollow copper containers in between the seats so as to reg resonate at the right frequency so the actor's voice would actually sound richer and sweeter and fuller uh, all the way to the back of the, of the theater. Um, in any case, uh, a few more skills are worth mentioning. The art of medicine enters the picture for Vitruvius because the architect needs to know uh, the earth, the climates, um, very preoccupied with water supply and what the sources, whether uh, healthy or unhealthy, are. And you can see where I'm going with this. Um, it, it's funny, he mentions that uh, architects should also be very familiar with the law, uh, mainly so uh, as to facilitate the writing of their contracts. Uh, careful regard, he says, uh, have to be, uh, has to be paid to the obligations of employers and contractors, uh, so that in fact both can be released from their obligations if a contract is carefully uh, written. Now, what I like in all of this is Vitruvius's clear understanding that the height of architecture cannot be realized without a full, extremely broad grounding in what we today would call the liberal arts. In my view, that argument needs to be made today as forcefully as it was in the first century BCE. Architecture is not just uh, engineering by any means, and I'm preaching to the, the choir here, although engineering deans are really pushing to incorporate more design and art into their curriculum, um, as are art history departments, which are realizing that studio classes in design may offer advantages to their students once they reach the job market. In fact, as a dean, it's sometimes interesting to me that the colleges of art and design and the schools of architecture aren't already combined, and we could even locate art history there just for fun uh, and create one comprehensive school of art, design, history of art and design and architecture. Um, and I, d I do really hope you recoil from this suggestion. But um, <laughs> as an outsider, it isn't really for me to tell you how to define the contours of your discipline. Nevertheless, I do agree with you that there is real urgency that such contours uh, be mapped out. And here's why. More and more these days, undergraduates are double and triple majoring uh, in the liberal arts. 
Uh, it's quite common to see dual degrees in biology and philosophy or political science and chemistry. Uh, everybody's pre-med, of course, when they arrive. It's after that first organic chemistry course that many of them realize that'll never be possible for them. Um, <laughs> humanities disciplines in particular are not growing concentrators in most areas, uh, but they are growing as minors and as companion degrees uh, allied with some other, uh, some other discipline. Uh, in general, the humanities are being, to some extent, marginalized. Um, but as I say, uh, not totally. They're just kind of popping up in different ways uh, as students in general are moving toward the social sciences. That is the huge trend over the last decade that students are moving into fields like psychology, political science, and sociology in much larger numbers than in any other of the natural sciences or the humanities. Um, foreign language study, uh, the kind of thing that um, most schools used to require, are now, is now becoming optional at many universities. It's not here at Michigan and it's not at a lot of the uh, private schools, but many universities are in fact making foreign language skills optional. Um, but I want to say that um, there's something else happening. And it's not just uh, because of the recent economic downturn. It's something that we've been watching for a long time. Undergraduates are increasingly pushing for more pre-professional training. And universities are responding. Uh, professional schools like business, public policy, and others, for example, uh, are building their programs on the back of liberal arts degrees. Now, I, in general, have absolutely no problem with this. Um, but it's a response to the sense on the part of parents paying higher and higher tuitions that their students need to be prepared in some practical sense for uh, the world uh, after they graduate um, from school. So here's what I want to leave you with. I want to leave you with this thought that I think the way out of this for all of us, and it speaks directly to pedagogy, is that we have to extend a hand to each other to keep this partnership going between liberal arts colleges and professional schools to give students opportunities to be exposed early in their undergraduate careers to what, professional, uh, what professions are and what they may look like, but at the same time to protect those early years of undergraduates to explore as broadly as possible. Because like Vitruvius said, that really is that huge broad base and deep base uh, almost incomprehensibly broad base in liberal arts uh, is, in fact, uh, the pedagogical foundation of uh, today's modern architect, as I see it. Thank you very much.